Okay, here we are now recording. Uh, by request today from somebody in the first section, I created a third video for the week that's only two minutes long that shows you how to upload your course assignments. So it shows you how to upload your two tutorials and your course notes. So while we're on that topic, I'll remind everyone that the last day and time to submit your course assignments, that's both tutorials and your course notes, is Tuesday, May 18th at 10 a.m. So that is the time of our final exam period. Remember, there is no final exam. Your uh, assignments are to submit, to upload your course notes and your tutorials by Tuesday, May 18th at 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, UTC negative seven. Um, and I've now got a video that will be linked to my website sometime in the hour following this class that shows you how to upload those in case you don't know how. Um, if you're unsure about the success of your uploading, I request that you email me this week to ask if everything has uploaded appropriately. And I can confirm or deny whether everything has, but I am not gonna be very happy if 50 people suddenly, even five people suddenly email me on Tuesday at like 9 a.m. asking if they uploaded everything. Then the final exam period is not the time to confirm that everything has uploaded correctly. Please try this week to upload your course notes and your tutorials to make sure you know how and to make sure that everything goes through appropriately. You can upload as many times as you want. So even if your course notes or your tutorials are incomplete, that doesn't matter, upload them now just to make sure you know how to upload things. And then if you wanna do it again later, please do. I will only download the files for grading after 10 a.m. Tuesday, May 18th. So you have as many uploads as you could possibly want until Tuesday, May 18th at 10 a.m. Um, okay, let's see. There were some other course announcements that I didn't address in the first section of class because I plumb forgot. I think they were, uh, I will use the final exam period, Tuesday, May 18th, 8 to 10 a.m. as office hours. If you have any last minute questions that are not, how do I upload files? And I'll also hold office hours on Monday, May 17th at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. So that's essentially like our class times on Monday, but I will use them as office hours on Monday, May 17th, the day before our final. So I will be in office hours on Monday the 17th at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. as office hours, the same Zoom link and all. Um, the last set of announcements I have is today in lecture, I'm gonna try to keep it short, but I'm gonna try to do a course wrap up and also tell you why I think this class sets you all up really well for any kind of future in the world of statistics. Not that you're going to all be statisticians, but the theory is based on your major, there's a lot of people who think you will encounter statistics again in your future. And they have forced you into this class and specifically not a data centric class. And I actually think that's really good. And I'm gonna to try to wrap up the course content in this class today and tell you why I think you all are set up really well for encountering statistics again in your future now having taken this course. Um, the content of today does not necessarily need to go in your course notes. Um, it's just kind of like a summary of everything we've done in the class so far. So it's going to be really kind of high level uh, and really kind of quick. Hopefully it's going to mean a lot more to you than it did the first time you saw this diagram about the goal or goals of statistics. 
hopefully it's going to mean a lot more to you now that you have a reasonable understanding of what distributions and expectations are. So I'll glance over those two things quick and I'll come back to my diagram of goals of statistics and then I'll try to make the argument why this as a first course in statistics is really beneficial for you, probably better than a data centric course. The three, well, two videos I have for Wednesday, I would like in your course notes. The two videos I have for you on Wednesday, I would like in your course notes. The third video on Wednesday is about how to upload your course notes, and that does not need to go in your course notes. But the two other videos on Wednesday should be added to your course notes. They are quick. It should be mostly copy and paste from some R code into your course notes. So it should be pretty easy um, and shouldn't take you too long this week. I'm gonna pause and drink some water because I'm feeling parched already and we got 40 minutes ahead of us. So let's use that time for questions if anybody has them before I get started for the day. So just regular office hours this week? Correct. This week I'll hold um, all the same office hours, Wednesday and Friday, 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., just uh, like a standard week. I didn't see who that was, but I'm going to guess it was Jared. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, thank you. Other questions before I get going? Okay, here we go. This course is crazy. Let's not fool ourselves. When we study math, we usually study functions and it's, you know, kind of like functions has all, have always been. You put in some number and you get out some other number. This class deals with functions in a whole nother level. And I think that is part of the reason this class is particularly tricky Functions show up in multiple places to describe crazy things, not necessarily get some input and get some output. The output density is almost not really the point. It's probability area under these curves that is much more the point. Um, so the functions are there, but they're showing up in quite a different way. And I think that's part of what makes this class tricky from the get-go. One clear example of how functions show up differently in this class than they normally show up is for distributions. We use the word distributions as like a new um, word to define very specific functions. Distributions are functions which describe common patterns of data. So here in the world of statistics, kind of the first thing we started studying are these functions that describe patterns in which you might observe data. Distributions are functions which describe patterns in which you might observe data. And I think that's like starting into this functions aren't so simple idea that the world of statistics really kind of embodies. For instance, we have some named patterns like Bernoulli. And Bernoulli is a named pattern that describes data that only take on two values. And we don't really care what two values there are. So long as there's only two, we label one of them a one and the other one a zero. And then the Bernoulli distribution pretty much tells us how often the ones show up. And so it starts telling us the pattern with which ones show up. Ones show up at a certain proportion and zeros show up at kind of one minus that proportion. So the Bernoulli distribution is the first kind of named pattern with which data might show up. 
Then we pretty quickly went into a generalization of the Bernoulli named the binomial, which was like a sum of some number of Bernoullis. And we also ventured into the world of gamma distributions just a little bit. We didn't say too much about them. We pretty much only covered the fact that gamma distributions describe data that are non-negative. As long as they're only taking on positive values, then the gamma distribution is a pretty reasonable distribution to use. Now, these three were all kind of describing patterns with which the data themselves were showing up. But the crazy part was we fairly quickly got into the normal distribution and for not very obvious reasons. Now the normal distribution is one of the most common distributions, but the interesting thing is that rarely does data itself ever follow the normal distribution. And so it really kind of begs the question, well, why is the normal distribution so common if data itself rarely follows that pattern? And the simple answer is basically any other named pattern of data. So long as you take the mean and you look at the means, plural, of multiple data sets from any other named pattern, then the means itself, the means of the data, follow the normal distribution. So this is where the class kind of took like a whole nother step forward in using and abusing functions. First, we said distributions are patterns from which data come. So they're like patterns describing data. But then we started getting into, well, if you have a data set and you take a mean, means from basically any distribution, then means from basically any distribution follows the normal distribution. So this is where we started getting really crazy in saying that, okay, here is this function of data. The data itself came from some named distribution, but now as long as we add up all the data and divide by however many there are, then we're to think of that new quantity as a random variable itself. And that new random variable follows its own pattern. So now there's functions of data that follow patterns described by functions. And suddenly the class got deep. There are functions named distributions that describe patterns of data. Then there's functions you can apply to data, like means. And once you apply the functions like the mean to the data, then there's more distributions that describe the pattern of the functions of data. So as long as you have data from basically any named distribution and you calculate a mean, and then you imagine that there's multiple means from different data sets from any of these named distributions, then the means themselves follow the normal distribution. And we even went about proving that. I didn't spend too much time on the proof itself, but I at least showed you that there is a high level of mathematics that tells you means from basically any distribution follow the normal distribution. Do you guys remember the name of that grand theorem that tells us means themselves are random variables and they follow the normal distribution? The central limit theorem. Nice, Jacob. So this was a result from, let's write it out, from the central limit theorem. Okay, so here we are in this crazy world of statistics. We now understand that distributions and often named ones govern patterns of data. 
And if you get a little bit more abstract, you can start thinking of means of data and those means follow patterns themselves. We have grand theorems in statistics that tell us the patterns of means. Okay, so we started getting a good understanding of distributions in this class. It certainly wasn't, you know, like we're all stats majors now. We don't have that kind of understanding of distributions, but we at least understand at kind of this basic level that there's functions that describe patterns of data. So we started taking these distributions. We started looking at them as if they are these entities, these objects, which have properties. We started looking at distributions themselves and recognizing that the distributions have properties. So we learned about these properties. Distributions have properties associated with them. And these properties are defined via expectations. It's my personal opinion, though I don't get too much feedback from you all via electronic learning like this. It's a little awkward, I'll be honest. But my personal feeling is that once we started hitting expectations, that's where the class got a little bit more abstract. So they're just this operation defined on distributions that establishes some properties for these things. Some of these properties themselves have names like the mean. And we started imagining that the mean is a value near which most data tend to show up. The mean is the value for which most data kind of gather around it. But we also started thinking about means in a little bit different way too. The mean is kind of some measure of the centralness of a distribution. So we started thinking about it as the mean is the point along the x-axis that kind of balances out the density. So relative to the density that I just drew, there's kind of like some bulk off to the left. And then there's like a long tail that kind of goes exponentially down. And the mean is the point along the x-axis, the fulcrum point for the engineers here, that balances out the density. It balances out the bulk with the really long tail. So the really long tail has low density, but there's a lot of it out there. It goes off to maybe positive infinity. So the mean is the point at which the function is well balanced. It's kind of the middle of the distribution in a sense, but it's also well known as the point at which most data will tend to show up. So we started looking at a bunch of these properties, which are defined via expectations. We looked at means, we looked at the variance. We started imagining the variance as kind of like an average width of the distribution. So variance is just kind of telling us kind of the noise associated with the data that can show up. We started looking at percentiles. Percentiles got a little tricky, but it wasn't too bad, right? There was some value down here on the x-axis that we named Q that put such an amount of area, let's call it P percent of the area, to the left of the value Q sub P. We called those percentiles, kind of values that define these cutoffs such that there's like, I don't know, 70% of the area below that value. I have a question, okay. question for the mean. Yeah, go for it, Jacob. Um, will the mean always be where the highest point is? No, it won't. And that's why specifically why I drew this picture here, where I'm trying to show that the mean is off to the right 
from the highest point quite a bit, actually. Because it's trying to balance both sides. It makes sense. Right. And it just so happens that the normal distribution, which I tried to draw here, but I've done quite poorly, is symmetric about its highest point. Because it's symmetric about its highest point, the mean shows up at the highest point. But that is not always the case. So more generally, we should imagine the mean as the point along the x-axis that balances the function. Great question. Other questions before I move on? Okay, good. So here we are in this class. We've learned about distributions. These are functions that kind of tell, that kind of um, dictate patterns with which data show up. And then we started exploring expectations because the distributions themselves have some properties like where most of the data show up or how wide the data are when they do show up or a point at which most data will be above. And then we started imagining that what's actually happening in the world of statistics is this kind of data collection process. So here is my classic picture of the goals of statistics. Now I'm gonna first write it in a sentence, but the sentence is gonna be kind of this high level now that we have a better understanding of these statistical ideas. The goals of statistics estimate expectations using data. That is really what statistics is doing. Now that we have these tools to understand this sentence, it helps a little bit. But let me kind of bring it back to the picture that I was commonly drawing for us early on in the class. I was drawing a picture like this. There is this world of distributions. And we believe that these distributions describe the patterns with which data show up. And there are these properties of these distributions, things like the mean. And we want to know what value that mean has. So in the world of statistics, what we do is take data from the distributions by randomly sampling. We randomly sample data from the distributions and we end up on this other side of statistics where we basically have capital N data points. And now the goal of statistics is to estimate this quantity, this mean and expectation using data alone. So what we often do is calculate the mean from the data alone. Add up all the data and divide by however many there are. And in R, we've been writing this as the mean of X. But what we've started learning is this, that, is this mean is actually converging to as our sample size, capital N, goes off to positive infinity, this data calculation is actually converging to, in the limit, an expectation which we know of as the mean. And specifically, specifically, it's the mean of some distribution. Now, which one depends on the case and depends on how your data were collected, because if you're looking at a different pattern, then the pattern's governing the type of distribution and the type of distribution is governing the mean you are looking at. So the goal of statistics is to estimate expectations using data alone. Based on the data that we get from this distribution, can we estimate that expectation? We never know these properties on the right-hand side, but we want to know them. So we take some data 
we calculate a mean, and that mean is estimating these expectations. Okay, so I'm gonna start working this discussion towards why I think this high level, very mathematical course is beneficial for you all. In section one, I started saying how this course was really beneficial for engineers. And I think that's true, which is why most of the sections this semester are for engineers. But in fact, the argument works for basically any major in this class. If you're coming to this class, I personally believe this class is better for someone who is gonna see statistics again in their future careers than a data-centric stats class. And here is why. I have two main reasons. The first, this random sampling here is a class of itself, of its own. Random sampling is an entire class at Chico State. It's Math 458. And I'm not suggesting you all have to go take Math 458. I'm just trying to tell you, now we are entering the world of statistics, and it's actually this huge wide world where random sampling itself is an entire topic devoted to one whole semester's class. But I think you all have a really distinct advantage to understanding the content in math, math 458. And the reason is, if you frame random sampling in terms of distributions, the entire topic makes a whole bunch more sense. If you come at random sampling without the concept of distributions, then random sampling doesn't quite make the same amount of sense. You can certainly talk about it and give some intuitive ideas, but it doesn't quite fit the same way without understanding a little bit about distributions. So I think Math 350 is an exceptional start to a future that might encounter statistics again, because you all have enough mathematical machinery to talk about distributions themselves. Without kind of the high level mathematics, you don't talk about distributions themselves. You only stick to the data side. And the data side is really kind of limited because you don't know what you're actually estimating. But in this class, we can introduce you to what you're actually estimating. You are estimating properties of the distributions from which data came. You are estimating properties of the distributions from which you collected data. So if in your futures, you encounter more details of random sampling, it will make a whole lot more sense than if you didn't see distributions at all, which is pretty much what happens in data-centric classes. In data-centric stats classes, you rarely see distributions at the same level that we saw them this semester. But I argue that seeing distributions in such depth helps you understand random sampling. A really quick example is customer reviews on products. For instance, Amazon gives um, lots of customer reviews for most of their products, but all of the customer reviews are optional. All of the cu customer reviews are voluntary. Because they're voluntary customer reviews, what you end up getting is people who are on the extremes. They're either extremely happy with the product or extremely pissed off about the product. Because you get the customers on the extremes, you can think of that as like customers only out here. The picture doesn't entirely match my story, but it's an analogy and it works okay here. If you get only data from the extremes in the right tail, then your data here, when you calculate a mean, are not going to estimate an expectation well. So a whole concept of random sampling is that of biased data. Biased data is that which maybe comes voluntarily, not randomly. Voluntary um, customer reviews, like on Amazon, often will give you biased data, data way out in the extremes. When you get this data way out in the extremes, 
and then you calculate a mean from that data, those means are not going to estimate the expectations well. Because look, you have no data near the mean. So why would your data estimate the mean well if your data is way up here? But that's an insight that's much easier to see when you have the idea of distributions. Okay, so that was my first um, claim of why this class is beneficial for your future careers that may encounter statistics again. I'm going to pause here again for like another 30 seconds to see if anybody's got questions at this point, and then I'll launch into why I think this. Reason number two, why I think this class is super beneficial, better than a data-centric intro to statistics. Okay, nothing, I'm on a roll. You guys are letting me go, good. Okay, reason number two. We lately have started getting into distributions that describe the relationship between two or more variables. We have started getting into distributions that describe the relationship between two or more variables. So I'm gonna draw a bunch of dots here, but I'd like you to imagine that there's this infinite collection of dots describing a distribution. Just like this whole distribution here, this whole function is like an uncountable set of data. It's an entire function, right? It's not just the data points themselves. You've got to imagine there is this joint density describing the relationship between two or more variables. There is a joint distribution here describing the relationship between two or more variables. And so when you take data from these multiple variables, you randomly sample data, and then you have now capital N observations for your variable Y and capital N observations for your variable X. But the same thing is happening down here, just the same, whether you're calculating means of X or calculating conditional means, that is means of conditional expectations, the same underlying thing is happening. You are using data alone to estimate conditional or not expectations. Now these conditional expectations turn out to be totally cool because what they're actually saying is based on the value you're conditioning on, the expectation of X will change based on the value of Y, the mean of X might change. The average age of 10 year olds is different than the average age of 30 year olds. Based on your age, your average height might change. Based on your age, your average income might change. Based on your education level, your average income might change. What you all are here hoping in the world of statistics and whatever your major is, is that down here on the x-axis is the number of years of education, and on the y-axis is your expected salary. And you all are hoping there is this positive relationship like this. As years of education goes up, your expected salary go up. And if you were to collect a bunch of majors, a bunch of graduates from Chico State, you would hope that the data would suggest this kind of positive relationship between X and Y. And in fact, it tends to, which is good because that's what we're here doing. But these are the sorts of questions that we are literally opening the doors for the world of statistics to start answering. We're now answering based on data alone, how can I estimate expectations or conditional expectations to tell me about the relationship of two or more variables? How can I use data alone to tell me about the relationship between two or more variables? And without the understanding of distributions, I think it's much harder to understand 
that what you're actually looking at is a conditional expectation. Without distributions, it's really hard to see a line through data like this and understand that those are conditional expectations. Conditional on some value, we expect a new mean. That's what this class is bringing to the table. Once you have understandings like that, picking up the random sampling side or picking up the data side is really not as difficult. The difficult part is having the mathematical machinery and having the tools, the mathematical tools to understand this distribution side. This is where the value of statistics really comes in because this is the side that's describing the processes in the world from which we observe data. Okay, I've got one last spiel. I'm gonna to try to cram it in, in like under five minutes and then hopefully we can get out of here early. Look, this is an intro course. So there are going to be topics not discussed. I want to open your eyes to what those topics are so that if you're interested, you know how to seek them out. We, in the last two weeks of this class, have been particularly interested in conditional expectations of some kind of linear form. So this is saying that the relationship between Y and X is some kind of linear form, where as X increases, Y changes by beta one. That is beta one, not beta i. As x increases, y changes by beta one. We're now describing the relationship between x and y mathematically. Now, what we've been doing in this class so far is estimating the expectations based on data, or at least we've been talking about estimating the entire expectations based on data. But what we haven't been doing is talking about how to estimate the individual components themselves. We have not talked about how to estimate the components of a conditional expectation. And you know how I said randomly sampling is a topic in itself that consists of an entire course? Well, the entire major of statistics is actually concerned with how do we estimate these components of conditional expectations? This is what the entire discipline spends most of its time doing. In order to estimate expectations from data, we need to have a better understanding of how to estimate the components that describe the relationship between two or more variables. And we can use those to then tell us about conditional expectations themselves. So this is like the one level deeper that statistics actually spends most of its time doing is estimating the components of a conditional expectation instead of just the conditional expectation itself. And so my recommendation for you all is to email Dr. Kathy Gray here in the math department at Chico State about Math 450. We normally teach Math 450 as a third semester of mathematical statistics, but just next fall, Kathy is teaching it slightly different because this last year was so crazy and because she thought she would be fun and teach a different topic. Um, she's opening up Math 450 to anybody who's interested and has passed Math 350. So if you're interested in these sorts of more advanced stats topics or you're looking at like a stats minor, Math 450 is going to be a great option which gets you into these topics not discussed in 350. Math 450 next semester is going to be taught um, with the sub-discipline 
Bayesian statistics. It turns out it's actually my favorite topic in the world of statistics. It's where I spend all of my research on the topic of Bayesian statistics. Unfortunately, I am not teaching the course next semester. I would love to, but I'm going on sabbatical for a year. So Kathy has um, decided she would do it herself. And I think she does a really good job teaching some software actually that I have contributed to, some like uh, open source software that I've spent a lot of my time contributing to. So I think it's really nice that Kathy Gray has decided to open up Math 450 to anyone who's passed Math 350 for Fall 21. And I highly recommend that course as a follow-up to this if you are interested in the more advanced topics in the world of stats. I'm gonna end lecture for Monday here and say a hearty and very honest thank you all for um, a crazy and exciting semester. It's certainly the weirdest uh, I've ever experienced. It was an adventure and certainly an experiment on my end. I'm not sure the experiment went great, but uh, there's hope that we will be back in person in fall 21 uh, if everything goes as planned. I don't know if that's confirmed yet, but it's certainly a big hope of the campus and shared by many of us. So thank you all for your time. Thanks all for your hard work in Math 350 this semester. Um, and I hope you all have a great summer. I'll stick around for the next eight minutes if y'all have any questions.